On a cold evening on November the 1st, 2003, a 14-year-old schoolgirl said goodbye to her sister on Blackpool Pier, went off to the arcades and was never seen again. 20 years on, it remains one of the biggest unsolved mysteries. What happened to Charlene Downs? No body was ever found, no remains uncovered. No concrete evidence has ever told us the story of where this young girl ended up on that tragic night. The amount of failings by all the people that were meant to actually protect Charlene, you know, everybody just failed. It's not something I'll ever get over until she's found, until I've got some answers. But then I'd love to go and literally like to take the law into my own hands. They took my daughter, I could take them. The PC, sorry, <laughs> that gets in the way of protecting our children is diabolical. I feel as though I know what's happened to Charlene Downs, but it's not something that can verbalise or broadcast. To grind a body through a mincer and not leave any DNA anywhere is near on Im impossible. Obviously, I'd like to see a, a resolution to this case, you know, but as to whether there will be, I'm not sure. Who knows? But that maybe she is out there. Two men were tried in May 2007, one for Downs' murder, the other for helping to dispose of her body, but the jury failed to reach a verdict. While lurid and sensational rumours still circulate about how Charlene's body was ground up and sold as kebab meat, there has still been no definitive proof that this is what happened. But then the court case happened and all this stuff about, uh, you, you know, the, the CPS did assert that these two men that they'd arrested, because they dropped all the nominals and concentrated on these two men, I think it was three men at the time. Um, and these outland this outlandish line about um, a, a, a little girl being um, sexually exploited uh, and then murdered and crushed into, uh, a, a body crushed into, to me, to, to, to put into kebabs. And the bones crushed into tile ground. That's outlandish, isn't it? So you have a look at that. There isn't, I still haven't seen any, um, any evidence that, that would suggest that Vessi and, and Albertihi are anywhere near the, the, you know, the, the, the end of the timeline with, with Charlene Downs. Still haven't seen anything, but they still pressed ahead with the case, you know, and the feeling that, you know, if you're, you're a kind of lower working class, kind of poor, uh, white um, kid on the streets of Blackpool, no one gives a toss about you. That's the case. No one gives a toss about kids like Charlene Downs. Charlene's disappearance quickly unearthed some very dark truths of the awful things that were being done to vulnerable young girls in Blackpool. A police investigation revealed that she'd been one of an estimated 60 girls who were being groomed for sex in the resort. Charlene and her friends had been hanging out in a dark and narrow back street that a number of takeaways backed onto. Later, it transpired that a group of men who had been working in these takeaways at the time had been giving young girls, some as young as 11, cash, cigarettes and food in return for sexual favours, an activity known as localised grooming. This was just the tip of the iceberg. Now, after two decades, the question still remains, will we ever know what really happened to Charlene Downs? Charlene moved to the resort in 1999 with her mum and dad, Karen and Bob Downs, and three siblings, Emma, Rebecca and Robert. They lived on Buchanan Street in central Blackpool, having moved from Coventry in search of a better life. Charlene was described by those who knew her as pleasant, cheeky and always smiling, but she also had a rebellious streak. She loved being around animals and children, and she also loved going to the theatre. 
it was just a normal Saturday really. She got up as normal, had a bath and watched her Darren Day videos as she always, it was Darren, she was mad on Darren Day in them days. And she'd been to see him previously at the uh, Winter Gardens with a nana, and she'd met him. And she'd had a, he'd like give her a rolls graph, even some free tickets. So she was watching it, and she'd bought the, we bought her the video, which, as I say, that morning she was playing. I do remember her, you know. And, I mean, she, she came to see a lot of shows, a um, lot of my performances. But also, as I said to you on the phone, you know, she... Uh, she would sometimes, you know, she'd just come down and have a chat with me at stage door. She wouldn't necessarily have seen the show that night. Or she might, have, she might come down and have a little chat with me before a show or, um, or after a show. And, uh, and, yeah, there's something, of, you know, sometimes in life you meet people and they just stay with you. And I think one of the things that makes me remember her is I was worried about her. You know, she, I just, there was just this thing, she seemed to me, I think I just remember being worried for her generally. And I, I did feel she was troubled and I always made time for her, you know. She used to come down and I always appreciate anyone who follows my career or comes to stage door or both. Um, but she was like there a lot, you know, and, uh, and I always made time for her. But there was just something about Charlene that, kind of, sometimes I just wanted to go, tell me about, you know, are you all right? What's going on? Is, it, is everything all right? But you can't do that. So the night she went missing had been a typical cold, dark November evening. It was a Saturday night. Charlene had been in town with her older sister, Rebecca, who was 16 at the time. They'd bumped into their mum at around 6.45 p.m. This was on Church Street, where Karen had been handing out leaflets for an Indian restaurant. Rebecca went home, but Charlene stayed in town. She said she was off to meet some friends at the arcade. It was the last time they would speak. 